All right, we're live. Let's wait for a few people. So if you can see us, let us know if you can uh, hear us clearly. We have been struggle with audio in the past few sessions. If you could let us know if you can hear us, that would be great. Welcome. Anything with audio? Yeah, I know, every time. All right, so, hi, Sean. Okay, so. 13 people, welcome everybody. Loud and clear, love to hear that. Um, always, we like to know where you are and always excited to see people from different places. Let's get a conversation started. Um, I will show show this, see what, if we could uh, present something. Mm, share screen. What happened? Okay, let me see here. All right, can you guys hear, see? Okay, so this session, we're gonna talk about common issues with emission trucks. Of South Africa. Yeah, wow, South Africa. <laughs> so long ways. Well, every, welcome everybody. Seems we have a good start. 27 people already, excited to see everybody. And, uh, well. APU. Um, with the EPU, APU, um, actually, we just drilled the holes in the back of the cab here about a half an hour ago. Um, the first unit, we uh, got the battery box kind of figured out. Um, so I had uh, some issues with sourcing a prefab battery box. Um, I think we talked about this last week, but Iconic Metal Gear, I think they're up in Ontario, Canada somewhere. They actually offer like a step battery box which is pretty cool for some applications and they have one that goes like down in your frame that has like a horseshoe cut out for your drive shaft um, but they won't um i called them and told them like about you know five or ten units at once directly they're like somebody's buying like 50 or 80 at a time so i'm assuming it's either a fleet or somebody that's doing possibly you know something like we're doing um so they told me like eight weeks if i placed the order last week to get those boxes so we bought them at antiquated metal break probably world war ii area and <laughs> we're just going to build our own battery boxes here so um, but we we found a, a freightliner battery box for this first truck um, used so we're going to go with that but hopefully tomorrow we'll have this first unit operational so it's kind of a long long update i guess but yeah that's what's going on with that <laughs> all right so stop right there before people uh, get into today's topic about emission stuff. I'm assuming some people have emission. Let me do some housekeeping stuff. And again, welcome everybody. Um, let me go to, let me see, next one. All right, welcome everybody to today's live stream. And uh, before we get started, you know, we always like to introduce our video sponsor. Um, today we're going to talk about rig. I believe some people are if you watch our previous video, uh, we made a few videos about rig. This is uh, um, a platform that connect truck drivers with mechanics. So they uh, they really transforming the trucking repair business. Kind of like an Uber or yeah. Lyft for service yep. and drivers. So yeah. So. Uh, so there are two apps, and uh, you know one is for drivers. So if you have issue, if you broke down on the road and need a tow, or you need to change your um, tires. Um, so for, for, for rig, you just, just log into the, the, the app and, uh, you know, find your local mechanics that's sign up with rig and they have nationwide, uh, mechanics. Um, so you can, you're, you're able to pick the mechanics you like, and you can also see their price very transparent. So this is a great app for, uh, drivers, uh, also for, for mechanics, if somebody like, uh, like us wanted to become independent and, uh, you know, make more money. Um, become your own boss. You know, for us, when we started our business, it was uh, we use Google um, advertising. We spent a lot of money. AdSense, yeah, yeah. spent like four hundred dollars a month, and you know. it didn't really get a lot of quality <laughs> customers, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, it was a start. So. Yeah, it was it was very difficult to start with you know somebody small. You have to do a lot of uh, marketing, and especially you are not you're a mechanic. You want to do more of a you know repairs instead of marketing. But a rig actually help you. You know, it's automatically bring customers to you to yourself without you at marketing it. So there's a for mechanics you can uh, download it. It's a great app, and we we talk to the people who created the app, and they're they're really uh, entrepreneurial and uh, so. So if um, you know if you guys are interested, to visit the uh, Big Rig app to uh, download iOS, Android, both. So now let's uh, that's enough about me. Uh, let's talk about uh, today's topic. All right. So before that, you know, always as always, a reminder everybody: if you are not subscribed, su uh, subscribe and like and comment, and that will be really helpful to our channel to continue to grow and uh, you know reach out to more people. All right, now let's get into today's topic. All right, I'll stop sharing. All right, your turn. All right, um, so I had a comment there. I'll touch on real quick. Uh, doing a valve adjustment on a uh, Packer MX-13. Uh, yeah, we can handle that. Um, I've done a couple of those. I've actually done my personal. I had a, I had a 17 uh, T660 with an MX-13 and did the first valve adjustment on it because I got it basically new. Um, but yeah, yeah, we can uh, give us uh, give Sophia a call here at the shop or email us and we'll try to get you set up. We are pretty busy right now, and uh, we're going to be going out of town at the end of the month. So we'll be going uh, on a little trip, so there's be a little bit of dead time there. So we're trying to get everything caught up here before the end of the month, and then uh, we'll be out for about a week and a half or so there over the uh, Fourth of July holiday. All right, um, so. Uh, as you guys, a lot of you might know, um, or you don't know, we do have two businesses here. Um, our secondary business is a uh, diesel emission specialist. And what we do, we have all of our own DPF clean equipment. We have, a, I mean, those of you that watch the channel, you know, we have the big oven, we have the uh, air pulse machine, inspection table, cooling table, all that stuff. And then we have a basic full service uh, welding fab shop where we can do Put in new bongs, uh, temp sensor bongs, pressure sensor bongs, all that good stuff. Um, so instead of buying, oh, if you got a bad bong, um, some places might tell you, you know, you need to buy a whole new DPF or DOC. Well, we can actually cut those out, let a new one in, and uh, replace them. I think we charge 125 bucks or something versus, you know, maybe 2000 for a new filter because of simply bad threads in a bong or something. So, so uh, yeah, so we kind of specialize that in that stuff, and my other... Our other business, uh, like our service business, kind of they kind of work together hand in hand. Of actually, you know, we have a lot of walk-in customers that kind of come in lately locally, fleets and stuff that are bringing filters and one boxes in loose. Um, but then our other business, the Fox Truck and Tractor business, actually we do full service. If you drive your truck in here, we um, kind of work hand in hand. So, like I said, anyways, that's kind of our specialty here. Our kind of yeah, so we like to be. Um, so missions issues, the number one thing is you got to have some type of tool out here. You need to be able to see what's going on. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we're a big fan of OTR. Uh, it's a pretty good product, I think, uh, especially when you get derated, um, any type of fault. So you can actually see what it is. A lot of stuff is simple. Most of the problems that we see are electrical problems, sensors, uh, metering units, uh, metering units are another thing. Like I've had people like, oh, we've never, we never had any trouble with metering units. Well, just because the flow test or volume test is good doesn't mean I have a customer in the shop right now. Um, he was at it, another mechanic or um, another, uh, maybe possibly a dealer. I can't remember. Uh, but they had pulled the metering unit out, did a volume test and everything else, and he's still having low conversion efficiency. Uh, we went ahead and pulled the box out, inspected it. The box and everything looked fine from what we could see, you know, and we ex I can't see inside of the SCR. I mean, we can see the face and the uh, exit side of the SCR. Everything looked good there. DSCs looked good. Um, but when we had pulled the meter needed out, the, the, the nozzle on it was completely crystallized over flat. I mean, so like nothing, if that spray pattern isn't right, um, you know, th th there's... If it's just if it's not spraying the right pattern, then you're you're it's just dose or dousing, you know, like if it's not I don't know how to explain this that way. Um an improper pattern, improper spray, it, it can face plug your SCR. 
then you know that's when you get reduced knock sufficiency as well. So like freight liner, it's like all oh, you have to put only one box on. I mean, we've had probably close to 95% success rate here with um it was actually cleaning, you know, putting the box in the oven, burning it out, cleaning everything, new gaskets, clamps, and putting the new meter needed on. Um, and, and probably 95, I think almost every box we've done, we put a new meter needed on. And like I said, we, I don't, we haven't had too many come back. I think we only had one or two yeah. that have come back. So, so I think we do have a decent job, but, um, but again, I, I, I can't stress enough is that you need to have some type of tool out there on the road. Um, for one, I, I mean, we have another customer with a box, a ZZ box truck that, that came in and he took it to a dealer and you're going to say which one, <laughs> uh, but they said, all oh, you need like that, like so many thousand dollars, all this work, you need to replace everything, USCR, DOC, everything. Uh, I don't need, yeah. I think it was close to 10 grand or something with the quota sky. I brought in here, uh, had an open, uh, open short on the uh, metering unit and got underneath the truck and looked at it. The harness was unplugged. Somebody physically unplugged the metering unit from the, the harness from the metering unit. So plugged it back in, the code went away, did a regen, and everything was fine. So, I mean, uh, all the, all the, the you know, the inlet and outlet knocks, everything, conversion efficiency, everything did a full regen itself and shut off. All, all the faults were gone, everything, um, because one the meter unit was unplugged and then they're they're trying to tell this guy that needs all this list. I don't know if it was unplugged before it went there or after it went there, what the deal was, but you know, it was we had an hour into it and you know, a license fee for the for the computer. So so I mean that's all it takes is one little thing, you know, bad connection, wiring harness, sensor, bad metering unit, you know, and and, and you you know if you if you go to the wrong place you could be into the ten thousand dollars or more really easily so um our strategy here is that i mean we have somebody coming with emission problems i mean first thing we do we'll either do a scr conversion efficiency test look at the numbers or uh, go ahead and run a full region look at everything you know differential pressures uh, conversion efficiency and all that stuff temperatures um, we found even on uh, some of the, the DD-15s, when they're heating up to do a regen, they actually actuate, I believe, the number two uh, engine brake solenoid. And we found where they won't heat up the regen, won't get hot enough, uh, because that solenoid's bad, um, which, so it won't, it won't even start regening because it won't get warm enough. So just simple stuff like that. Um, it, it's pretty – there's a lot of things tied into this stuff. So, I mean, what our strategy here is we usually – get them in. We do this first test. If we see an issue, we usually pull everything apart. You know, look, look, we like to have a good baseline. If it's a dirty filter, dirty SCR, dirty DOC, we like to get that clean first. And, you know, typically not always, I mean, a lot of times our customers come in, they've already put new knock sensors in because that seems to be the number one solve all throw their knock sensors on it when half the time there's nothing wrong with the knock sensors that's on it. Um, but so a lot of our customers do come up with knock sensors, so we typically don't replace those. Um, you would know, do a lot of temp sensors. Temp sensors are relatively inexpensive. Um, so, yeah, a lot of time on the one boxes, uh, the harnesses, I just saw a comment in there about uh, Freightliner harnesses. Uh, on the one boxes, they're pretty cheap. I think they're only for a, whole, a total, on, depending on what unit it is, most of the one box harnesses are only like 200 bucks or something. So it's not like a Cummins where some of the Cummins ones are, you know, 700 to 1,000, and they're even a smaller, simpler harness for some reason. Um, so that's one one thing that most of the stuff's relatively cheap, like metering units, you know, five, 600 bucks, give or take. So, um, but yeah, um, what else do we have to add here? I, I just want to, maybe one thing to mention. Um, so people think emission is just, you know, like a self-contained components, but a lot of it, it's, part of the kind of engines connected with the engine yeah so I mean, engine you you know changing one component and you might fix the issue if it's just that component that you know is the problem but maybe if your engine is not running properly that can get your you know downstream your emission system make it dirty so easy or it, it's well there i mean your your after treatment system is only designed to handle a engine. certain amount of you know, your parts are laying on your inlet, you know, ox and soot, carbon, whatever. Um, they're, they're designed to take so much, you know, to process so much. So if your engine is 
got a bad injector or you know any other type of oil consumption problem where it's it's polluting more than what that engine can treat then it's obviously not going to be able to keep up you face plug DOCs especially if you're over fueling uh, if you got a bad seventh injector or a regular one of your six injectors is bad where it's where you dump the fuel out the exhaust it'll go down and get caught in your DOC your DPF and then that soot just sticks to it keeps caking up um, you know, and, it, and then it does everything just gets worse as it goes downstream. The other thing, um, EGR cores can cause problems. That's what we recommend. I mean, if you've got an EGR core with five, six, seven hundred thousand, um, I you, in its original one, you might want to look at replacing that. I mean, we see with a lot of customers when we do replace them, you'll, you'll it'll basically pay for itself. You'll see a pretty good fuel economy again, sometimes, you know, a quarter to a half a mile. And fuel economy so i mean for you know two thousand twenty five hundred dollar uh egr core job replacement it can almost pay for its self and fuel savings in you know a few months i mean with the price of fuel and you know, depending on how much you run um but the other part side of the egr core thing is that if you wait till your EG co egr core goes bad and you're dumping a bunch of coolant into your after treatment system that that glycol and the coolant can actually ruin your doc and your SCR because those are a catalyst on um, that precious metal, you know, platinum, palladium, and, and all that good stuff in them. And it can actually contaminate those to where they won't do what they're supposed to do anymore. Um, so where if, if you've lost an EGR core, you might get into a lot of other costs where you're replacing a DOC or an SCR. Um, and that's one of the things, like if you're buying a used truck or, you know, when we, when we have people come into us, like we try to get all the history, like, okay, what's happened in the past? Because you're having an emissions problem and you just had an EGR cooler blow out two months ago and now you're having all these other after treatment issues. You probably need a deal. I mean, there's no sense of us even, you know, cleaning your DOC and all that because it's already ruined. It needs to be replaced. Um, same, you know, possibly with SCR as well. So um, those are all things to consider. And really, like if you're kind of going back to our, last week's topic, I think we were talking about. I didn't know it was a topic or the week before. Anyway, we did not too long ago. We were talking about buying used trucks. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing really to, to, to find, get as much history as possible. So before you buy that truck. And that's one thing, like if you're going into a shop um, for these types of issues, I mean, the more information background that they can get, you know, okay, then, you know, somebody can say, connect the dots and say, well, maybe that, you know, it's not this, it's because of that. And then you can just go ahead and cut all that extra um labor time out trying to track stuff down if you have that information going into it so I, hold on i think i wanted to mention two things uh, working with ryan you know i've been learned a lot <clears throat> since i've been dealing with customers every day um a couple of things maybe misconception people have when you have an emission fault code you just think you know <clears throat> clean the one box or clean the dpf and magically resolve everything it's not going to resolve everything because you know DPF filter, it, it is, uh, you know, it's a maintenance item. You're going to have to clean it. Um, we have a question there. We're going to get back to all the questions. We're going to save it to the <laughs> in a little bit. Um, however, you know, for other components, DOC, SCR, they are not designed to be changed all the time. So if those are dirty or face plugged, clean them will not resolve the issue because there's upstream um, components not working properly to make it face plugged. You know, after cleaning, cleaning is this first step. Then we're going to figure out what causes the face plug. Um, so, if, you know, if you go to the shop, your DOC is plugged in a week and you have the shop to say, you know, I'm going to clean it, then you would be good to go. Actually, you're going to come back to the same shop or another different shop another week because your DOC can be plugged again in a week. If you don't resolve the fundamental issues, you will never, you know. So always find a technician that knows what they're doing. Um, also, just equip yourself with the knowledge you can so you know more probably you you know what you wanted to do yeah. um that's the first and the other thing is that um for uh emission stuff for the fault code some fault code can direct you into just one issue and then you can definitely figure out that's inlet knock sensor not working so you need to replace that a lot of fault code they are result you know, because like of sensor com heater failure or yeah. a dew point, you know, yeah. pretty well, you know, it's most likely failed. So, so it's, it's not something that we can change. There's some overall, from, there's some yeah. generalized ones where it's really tricky to, to try to figure things out. And there was a comment in here about harnesses. Um, where? Yeah, where? we're replacing the ACM harness for five. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times with, um, 
you know, we'll look at something and we'll find there's a problem in a chassis harness or something. And I'll talk to a customer, like I could spend two days. I mean, I, I could charge you $2,500 to pull the dig through this harness and try to find a needle in a haystack. You know, when you got a, you know, a thousand feet of wiring to go through or more, so a lot of times that it does, it's cheaper just to buy another harness and just replace it. And, and then not only that, you've got a new harness instead of just, you know, 20 hour, you know, 16 hours of labor um, versus having, you know, about the same price of trying to find a needle in a haystack where you got, you know, it's, it's, it just makes more, I mean, my philosophy is just to replace the harness and be done with it. Um, but we do have a customer right now where with international where they're like two months out and lead time because it's a special harness. So depending on, like I said, well, with a lot of the freight line of harnesses, they are pretty economical and, in a lot of cases, we just recommend. I mean, if you got your plugs are kind of tore up, and ratty, and stuff like that, better just to replace the harness for versus trying to find an issue. So, which is kind of the opposite thinking. You know, a lot of times they don't just want to throw parts at things, but a lot of times my philosophy with wiring is it's it's cheaper and easier for our, us and the customer, and they're getting a the new product versus something that's just hacked up and butt connected, heat shrink together. So, yeah, all right, let's um, go do. I'm gonna go to from the the bottom to the top. You wanted to do this one. Mm. Before that, can you can you answer one question for people? What's the difference between sit load and uh, and ash load? I think I had a question from somebody. Make it clear. So your soot is basically what your regions clean out. That's what your when it's done a region, it's clean out soot. Um, your ash load is basically how full that filter is before it needs cleaned out. Um, and I don't, I mean, I've heard of some people running like 90% and they clean them out. But the thing is, the more you pack that filter, yeah, you can get it clean, but you're going to get less of a, you, you're not going to get as much out. So, I mean, I recommend doing them like before 50%. Um, and that way you're going to get more life out of that filter and be able to get more out of it. Because if you just keep, pack it you know with like okay. anything any type of filter i mean you, the more you pack in it the harder it's going to be to get it out um so like i said i, I wouldn't be running on the 90 like so we we recommend about 50 percent here um you know there was a comment about running on like 500,000. i think even a lot of the manufacturers are down around the two two hundred fifty thousand mark but i mean and that's what a lot of fleets do they run them to 500,000 miles and then that's when they sell them to the owner operators and then that's a nightmare after that for these guys that just are trying to get into business um, because there's never been any maintenance i mean if you i know we reckon i mean if you got a new filter i, I think you're probably fine to run it. i mean just my personal opinion you, you know even when I, we put new filters in our aftermarket ones i think probably 250s um as well and fine i mean after after you, if you're doing a clean filter or a remand filter and again like everybody's i get people said all the time like oh i got a remand detroit you know that is a glorified clean filter it's basically the same process we do here um it's a it's a used filter that's been cleaned you know at a factory that's why they facility. take cores from that's everything. why they take the core because they're taking yours and cleaning it unless there's a crack or damage to it so but they do the same basically same test that we do here uh, but I get people that come in like, oh, I got, I just put a Detroit filter in it. Well, it's a remand one, so it's just a clean filter. You're not going to get the same interval out of that as you would a new yeah. filter. I mean, on a clean filter or a remand filter, I mean, my recommendation is like 100, 150,000. I mean, I'd take it out and get it cleaned again because it's just going to be less. It's it's a maintenance thing. And I think that's a problem in this, this industry with this whole after treatment thing in the last 10 years, 10, 12 years. Is that there's this everybody just that you can just run it, run it, run it, run it. I mean, if you maintain the system just like you change your oil, I think you'll get a lot more less downtime and, and less problems. So and it doesn't it doesn't I mean if you don't if people that come in here just to get a filter clean, I mean they're not that hard to take off. And that's something that we're gonna kind of get into some video series here down the road once we get some time. Is actually like on each model, um, different systems like you know your X15. They're a little bit different than the ISX's after treatment system. So we want to do kind of how to like uh, removal and then installation of those filters, where you could take those out yourself and bring them to a service provider in your area or us or whatever. Um, and that way you save a lot. I mean they're not that hard to take out. I mean most of these units. I mean the one boxes are a little bit bulky and you need you know pallet jack or a forklift or something to get those out because they're 
few hundred pounds. So, but um, like your regular Cummins filters, uh, Packard is uh, the same as the Cummins systems, basically. I think they're made by Cummins because uh, they look identical does, to the ISXs and the X15s. Um, but they're not hard to take off. And I mean, if you got the capabilities to take those filters and put them back in yourself, I mean, for a to clean an EPF and, and a DOC, we charge 350 here to do a DPF. And in addition, if you bring in the DOC, it's only yeah. additional 100. And if we bring them together, it's only additional 150. So you can clean your DOC and your DPF for 500 bucks and your clamps, you know, or clamps and gas. I mean, if you can salvage your clamps, I mean, the gaskets aren't too much. So I mean, so if you can take them out yourself and take them somewhere to get cleaned and all that, I mean, it's not that expensive. It's not much more than a, you know, a synthetic oil change, really. It actually might be less than a synthetic oil change in your engine. Um, so it's, it's just maintenance. I mean, that's what kind of what we preach here is, you know, and, and taking, staying on top of stuff. Because if you have a, a, you know, a sensor or something going bad or an exhaust leak, um, exhaust leaks are another big problem, which I'll get into here in a second. Um, but the, the sooner you deal with that problem, the better off you're going to be because if, if something ain't regenerate right, uh, it's it's going to plug something up. You're just going to cause more downstream problems. So that's the other thing is being proactive about it and taking care of stuff as soon as you can. Yeah, what's our recommended intervals for cleaning DPF? I would say on a new truck, I'd probably do it the first time at 250, and then thereafter, on once you have you know, unless you put a new filter, if you just put, in, I mean, new filters aren't that much. Uh, most of them, I think we're like for for the one boxes, we sell those for like 1100 each, so about 2200 for new filters. Um, and for most of the Cummins ones, we're around 15, 1700 ish, depending on which one it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're going to put a new filter in, I would do, I would probably be around 250 on a new filter on a clean filter, a remand filter, I'd probably do 100 to 150,000, just depending on, um, how your truck's running and, and, and how you, you're, if you idle a lot, idle. if you're idling a lot, I would be on the lower side of that hundred thousand. So, cause that, uh, you know, everything's not heating up as a lot. The engines are a lot dirtier when they're not running at peak wow. temperature and, and performance and all that so yeah all right let's um, answer some questions going uh this one you wanted to talk about this one 2000 i would show it on the screen see if that makes any sense 2016 cascadia isx 15 from uh lance replace the dpf so uh, region twice a week in the last 5,000 miles. Um, that, that, I mean, if it's asking for a park region twice a week, uh, I think that's a little bit excessive. I mean, for it should be able to handle everything while you're driving down the road. Um, and like, like I said, unless you're idling an excessive amount, um, that, that could trigger that asking for more parked regions. Um, the other thing, one of the big problems we see is exhaust leaks. You know, especially in the uh, the bellows, those little accordion-looking things. Um, so if you ever see any soot or smoke coming out of those, replace that immediately. Because um, any type, any exhaust leaks or anything will cause a lot of issues. And and you can keep cleaning your filter, going to the shop, it, it, until you get all those leaks, gaskets. I mean, so I'd check all the gaskets, all the exhaust gaskets and clamps around your turbo all the way down to the one box, or you said it was an ISX, all the way down to the DOC. Um check all that stuff and make sure you don't have any leaks or anything like that. I mean, also could be a um, uh, differential pressure sensor, I mean, or a wiring issue because uh, we had a customer prior where his filter like sporadically would go from full to empty and empty to full and all this crazy. I'm like, like, you need to replace the wiring harness because obviously there is a intermittent failure issue somewhere. And uh, those types of things are usually wiring or a sensor. So, uh, so that's something to consider as well, because if it's not getting the right signal, it doesn't know what to do or not the right, you know, um, numbers back from your sensors and all that doesn't know what to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone hit the like button, please, right now, <laughs> because there's a demand. Everybody do that. Um, let's go back to there's one box of bad red because you have to play. Uh, here we go. Yeah, I mean. The one I don't know. It's not a terrible des I mean, design. I mean, they're for service. I think they kind of had an idea. I mean, if I had to guess, that people would just come in and change out the whole box. But the, the you know before 
2020, 2019, 2020, they weren't, it wasn't that big of a, it was all the COVID nonsense and all that. This stuff just like spiraled out of control. At one point they were like six months to get a box and it seems like the prices of them have like doubled. I mean, if they were only, you know, five, $6,000 and you start having issues, I mean, yeah, you can swap them out in two or three hours, just change the whole box out, you know? Um, so it was, wasn't a terrible thought, but I think the prices of everything have just spiraled out of control now to where it's a lot cheaper to, to try to fix things and clean them and, you know, replace everything. Uh, but yeah, it's unfortunate that only the DPFs are serviceable. I don't know why they haven't um, come out with like a weld-in DSL. I think there might be well, module there. design. I mean, the yeah, engineers I mean, uh, from Detroit started thinking about mod modular design because obviously one boss is, is an issue. Yeah. Yeah, especially I mean, I, I think the FC, the DOCs could be pretty, you know, weld-in design could be pretty pretty easily. Mm -hmm. come up with if you had the the bricks and um you know the, i mean especially because you don't really have to cut anything open there's just a ring in there you could just take a plasma cutter and cut and pull the old media out and let a new one in mm -hmm. um the scr is another handy you have to cut the whole end of it off I and mean, which still isn't uh, really out of our scope here but it's a matter of just getting, getting some material, material. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. I want to say something like most people come to our shop for one box issue. They all pretty much got a quote from one box, I don't know, from Freightliner dealer says they, you know, they have to replace the whole one box. The price is just outrageous. Um, one thing I want to let you guys know, the reason they sent you do a new one box because they don't have the machine we have to clean it. However, they take your one box as a core and they do clean it with a different location. So that's just controversy, in my opinion. Well, they have it's... the they they have the the bricks to cut them open, and put back in them as well. So yeah, I mean that's the, so. mm -hmm. yeah. Again, we know, have so they they are rebuilding them. So, yeah. but there is there's only I believe only one of them on the market, um, which is the filter therm that we have that will accommodate the whole oh, one, one box. box. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and ours they just barely fit in. But I believe there's going to be another box, new oven coming out soon that will accommodate up to four one boxes at once so. all right let's keep going with the questions uh i think i'm gonna go back up a little bit and make sure i cover the earlier questions um before we go to the latest one um i need the total replies that's i think we just talked about a one box why you know they always want to replace your one box um you said the number one problem we see is either failed DPFs where they they're they're just over they they take them to up to 90 100 percent and the trap's full and then you get so much pressure that they blow the back of the I've had them blow the back of the trap of the filter off or crack the filters and then obviously if you've got soot and everything else coming through it's gonna obviously lower your conversion efficiency and everything else because nothing's everything's going right through the DPFs so we've seen that and the other problem with conversion efficiency is typically a bad metering unit and you know death a bunch of crystallized death up in the scr that's plugging it so yeah i want to answer um Hamid's question so i think we touched uh, a lot of those in earlier uh answers uh ryan mentioned we don't recommend to clean your filter until it comes up problem comes up do it like a proactively yeah yeah I, 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 would, I don't item. that's that's the problem with this stuff i think and that's what's such an issue is that nobody does do anything until all the check engine lights and everything are on so if we we have several customers that come in that don't have that don't have any issues and we we clean their filter they they, they want to come in and do a maintenance i mean they want to clean their filters and have everything checked out and cleaned and and then they don't have any issues so it's just like changing your oil yeah. and that's kind of what the message that we're trying to get out there don't don't wait until you have, I mean, that's one good thing about having a, again, a service tool, you know, OTR, um, PDI, whatever, but something to watch. Like when, you know, one, you know, with, with being able to see real time data, like I said, with, with OTR is a little bit cheaper and a PDI, I mean, PDI has a little panel that or screen that you can put on your, your console or dash. So you can actually, you can set it up and you can see all your temperatures, your DOC, inlet, you know, outlet, DPF, SCR, in and out and all that. And you can see what everything's doing. And, and you can watch that data and, okay, now, if you you know, most of those temperatures, you know, DOC engine is 6 to 800. And the rest of your temperatures should be, you know, above 900. 
you know, if not a thousand or more. So if you see one, if something's out of whack, I mean, you know, okay, I need a temp sensor or whatever, because you won't, usually won't get a fault for a temp sensor because it doesn't know if it's negative 100 or if it's 1200 degrees outside. It doesn't, there's nothing basically to validate that. Um, so, but if you see wacky readings or something, if you got a temp sensor when you're sitting when it's 60 degrees and the truck's not running and the temperature sensor is rigging neg negative 30, then it's obviously going to be off, you know, because a lot of times those temperature sensors, if they're if they're negative 50 degrees ambient or pot, whatever, if they're off, that that can actually grow to where they might be 500 degrees off when they're up to temp. So, and that's when it, if you get over like 1200 degrees on a lot of units, it'll actually stop the regen, you know, even though it may not be 1200 degrees, it might only be a thousand. So, so it's good to have something out there to watch, you know, see, you know, what, what everything's doing, monitor everything. And then, um, and, and if you have something where you can see differential pressures and, you know, uh, conversion efficiency and all that, that's even better too. But, but uh, definitely I, I, I don't recommend waiting till you're derated and there's, because it just causes more problems so it's better i think it's better to be proactive so yeah i want to uh, put this uh, um like a banner out there kind of closer yeah, yeah we're getting closer um sorry i don't know how how this thing works hold on wrong one here so uh for OTR performance, you know, we have a lot of uh, guys that bought OTR performance because of us, and we just truly believe in it. And the, the company who developed, they're really proactive and develop really good software for people. It's just like not a mechanic, uh, but for mechanics, you know, just use the o OEM if you can, if that's better for you. But for OTR performance, if you don't have one, if you are thinking about getting one, we we always wanted to tell you we have a like a code from the company called as Road. Three, 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 four threes. You can get a hundred dollars off, and people love it. So, I want to share with you guys. And, um, like I said, not to keep trying to sell something, but but uh, we've had a lot of customers that have called us and like they they've had OTR or similar tool, and they're like, well, it's already derated, and they they've came in, you know, three, four hundred miles and made it here because they were able to keep clearing everything instead of getting you know towed here. So yeah, um, yeah, so people love it's it. It's a good insurance I mean, policy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna put it on the screen. Uh, well, Ryan, find the next. Question. I one more. Then it's gonna be. Yeah. So in, in any case, you guys um, need the code to get the hundred dollars off. It'll be always good. Save money is always good, right? Um, let's get to a few Go down other. The, the scanner for Packer. Yeah, I think we have one. I didn't. So if, as a mechanic, um, I think I have a question. What do you recommend? Diagnostic software. And then I skip that. Um, what's your recommendation for a software diagnostic software? Um, it really depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you're, if you just have a Cummins, I mean, that's the only truck you have. I mean, I'd probably go, you know, Cummins insight. I mean, you buy a common comm adapter, uh, about 700 bucks roughly like for an XIQ. And then the software itself is like $770 a year. Um, and like I said, that's for insight pro. If you have a Cummins, um, the other ones are like for Detroit Diagnostic Link, you're like 1900 a year for a license, so it gets pretty expensive. Plus, you buy a common after. Um, Davy software is like almost 4000 for the pack car, and I, I will not buy it. I mean, because <laughs> we just don't we don't see a whole, enough of them to justify spending for I mean, 4000 a year. Um, we've went back to jaw tests as well so we'll have some more coming out on that they've done some updates um so we'll, we'll be pushing some more out on that i mean for a good multi tool i mean especially if you're going across like if you're if you farm or something too or you do some excavating has a construction business um that's a dog test is a good uh, multi industry tool to where you can do on highway off highway you know construction ag whatever material handling um, so that, like I said, if you farm and if you're a truck driver, you know, and you're operating and you farm too and got a bunch of newer equipment, that could be a good option. Um, one of the ones we use here in the shop is the uh, Snap-on ProLink Edge, uh, the latest one. Um, it's a little, it's pretty pricey to get the master with kit with all the suites and everything for all the air brakes, all the makes, um, you know, almost 13 grand for everything. Um, but the one thing I like about it is that it's it's a self-contained unit you don't have to have a laptop it's pretty durable it charges from the trucks um, and the other thing is that it's a one-time purchase so um so there's no licenses or anything like that only you know if there's updates they push those out for free 
Um, the only thing which I just screwed up on the other day is that if they come out with a new version of that software suite, um, they do charge you for that upgrade, which I accidentally downloaded uh, Bendix the other day, but I, I think I'm going to purchase it anyways um, because they have added the uh, the wingman um, collision stuff. They, they've added that into where we'd be able to work on that stuff, which it wasn't in there before uh, for diagnostics and parameter for that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a big upfront purchase, but it, it's, it's nice. But, I mean, it's somewhat – I mean – any multi um, brand tool, you're obviously you're not going to get as much as you would buy an OEM one. But I mean, here we got to kind of control software costs. I mean, at one point I was spending like seven thousand dollars a year in licenses, um, and some of those we just we wasn't just wasn't using them, so it just it doesn't make sense for us. Um, so it's, it really just kind of comes down to what you're doing. I mean, if you just got one truck, I mean, I'd probably you know recommend. You know, uh, if you're kind of on a budget, I'd recommend OTR. I mean, I think with our code or whatever, it's like six or seven hundred dollars or something, yep. give yep. or take whatever they whatever they have going on. Um, so don't quote me exactly on that. Um, but then then there's PDI. I mean, PDI is nice because that has some other built-in features like a horsepower increase, uh, torque, um, and and optimum fuel, you know, economy optimization, all that. Plus, you have all the diagnostic tools in a little screen. But they're like twenty-four hundred ish, so that's kind of a big upfront purchase as well but again there's no license on that so it's really just kind of what you're what what all you do and what you want to do so is, is um so that's kind of my overall of all those options so if that answers your question i hope so we're getting um oh, i can't believe it's friday already <laughs> so yeah we gotta uh answer last question we can maybe is there... so Packard? Is there a scan tool for Packard? I think OTR handles Packard. It, yeah, uh, OTR will do Packard, and it actually should clear the D rates and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and I think PDI will work on Packard as well. I think it won't work on Volvo. I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. I know I've actually used the uh, uh, OTR on Packard, you know, for for customer and clear to D rate and all that stuff with it. So I know it does, does work on that. Um, there's not a lot else out there for Packer. Unfortunately, I think Pac or OTR is one of the few that will clear faults and D rates. I mean, uh, Packer is one, of, like I said, most, one of the most proprietary ones out there. And um, again, I, I just refuse to spend 4,000, 3,800 or whatever for Davy because we just, electronically i might get into four or five here a year so it never i mean i'd, I'd have to charge somebody you know 750 dollars or something every time i hooked up it just don't make sense so all right so if, should you answer this question real quick uh i have one broken exhaust manifold bolt can you take the bolt without taking the manifold out um if it's okay so yeah an exhaust manifold bro uh, bolt broken uh we see a lot of those on the ISXs. Seems like uh, if it's if it's sticking out past the manifold, I mean, you could probably you know put an extract a, a stud stud extractor or something on it. But um, if it's broken below, you're yeah you're you're not gonna if it's broken below the inside the manifold or in the hole, and, um, yeah you're gonna have to pull it off. It's just it's not even worth tearing, trying to tear something up or or uh, anything like that. So yeah, unfortunately, if it's if it's inside the hole, you're you're gonna have to pull it off. And and I, usually they're not too terrible. I mean, I, I I've had them broken off. The turbo studs broken off in the manifold. Those can be a challenge. Um, but usually the ones broke off in the head. I mean, half the time I've had them after we've taken the manifold and stuff off, I've just grabbed them by hand and twisted them out. And I didn't have to put a tool on them. Um, I think. Yeah, I might have had one that I had to drill. But, yeah, usually once you take it off, I mean, it's it's a lot of work taking the turbo and everything, drain the coal and take the turbo and everything else off. But, but um, yeah, if it's uh, if it's broke off down, in, if it's past the surface, then you're going to take the manifold off, unfortunately, because you're those are hard bolts. It's going to be hard to – and they're not very big either, so trying to put an extractor in, you risk breaking the extractor off. So I'd just pull it off. All right, so that's it. Uh, uh, we have a, a yeah. We're gonna get going. The um, the last question about you know you have a truck 
that's uh, 880,000 miles on it. So um, yeah, that's that could be a good topic to talk about next week with a truck has many miles. And we've been talk, thinking about doing a video about maintenance schedule for a certain miles, what you should pay attention to, what you should start to think about changing. Um, I have a hard time getting him to sit down and get that from his mind to the whiteboard, but I'm gonna keep working on it. So at some point we're gonna get that topic out and I'm sure it's be really, you know, helpful to most people. Yeah. Uh, so uh, unfortunately I think we're gonna get going now. I'm hungry and I think I need to pick up my kids. Yeah. It's really nice to see everybody uh, around 30 people, uh, maybe, you know, in and out, maybe more than 30 people. We're really happy to see you every week. Um, you come back next week and the same time, we're gonna talk about some other things, right? <laughs> All right, if you guys have any questions, suggestions, make sure to leave us a comment. Um, feel free yeah, to reach out to us. should have some updates on the uh, APU, APU, right? APU, APU yeah. here, so that should I'm gonna be done. Post some hopefully pictures, tomorrow, videos. so um, mm -hmm. yeah, we should have an update on how that's working out. Um, it's pretty warm here, uh, I think it was like 90 I'm here hot. today, so. I'm really hot. Um, so we'll actually have decent uh, conditions, not con good conditions for us, but good conditions for testing purposes, yeah. so. Yeah. But uh, anyways, with that. Uh, All right, thank you guys, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next week. Don't forget to subscribe. All right, bye-bye.